ladies and gentlemen. Yesterday was a very moving experience for me. <coughs> uh, the, in the evening when uh, I was um, involved in a welcome address where for the first time it um, hit me that we don't do that we don't listen enough to the elders, especially in India. And the welcome yesterday was very moving for me because for the first time I I understood how respected the elders are in New Zealand. That sort of respect you don't find as much in India. In Southeast Asia it is fast disappearing. So I would like to acknowledge the welcome yesterday, which was very uh, moving for me. This is not going to be a keynote address because there's so much informality here that if anyone should have a burning question while I'm speaking, please do not hesitate. I would like it to be interactive rather than only one way. It's Mark Twain who said, never let school interfere with your education. <laughs> school is where you learn how to read and write in many parts of the world. And education is what you get from your family, from your community, and from your environment. And that is what makes you as a human being, the education that you get from your community. Sometimes schools are in total contrast to what you learn from your community. Sometimes what the community gives you, which is your base, is devalued in some schools around the world, including India. When I went to a very, very expensive school and college in India, they actually deliberately kept you away from the reality of India, from what is happening on the ground, from the poverty of India, from the hunger of India, because that was very exclusive and very snobbish. And they didn't expect you to go back to roots. They didn't expect you to go back to community. So out of sheer curiosity, I actually went to a village in India and that changed my life. Because when I went to this village and I saw hunger and starvation and death for the first time, it really hits you between the eyes. And you keep wondering, what is this education all about? If it keeps you away from this reality. What is this education all about that you receive? That you can't do anything about it at the village level. And no one bothers, no one cares. India has, the, out of the 25, half of them, half the billionaires of the world are in India. 10 kilometers down the road from Mumbai, they can't see that there's poverty down the road. So where is the humanity? Where is the education that you get which deprives you of the humanity that you should have? And that is what you get from your community. So when I started the Barefoot College, it was because of a reaction to this whole <coughs> generation in India that is blind to what is happening in the community. <coughs> so when I went to Bihar and I came back and I told my mother, I told my family that I'd like to live and work in a village, it was completely devastating to her. She thought I was letting my country, my family down by going and she, uh, she was embarrassed because she didn't know what to say to the family because she would always ask me, what will I tell the family? What are you doing? And I said, I'm digging wells in the middle of the desert in Rajasthan. And just she couldn't, explain, she couldn't understand what had motivated me, what had compelled me to take such an important step. And that for five years when I dug wells as an unskilled laborer, I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge, skills, and wisdom that very, very poor people have who have nothing, nothing to give. They have no money, living a hand-to-mouth existence, but they had such rich skills, such wisdom, such knowledge that was 
under, undermined, it was devalued, not recognized, not respected. So I thought I would start a barefoot college only for the poor. And we redefined professionalism. Who is a professional today? It's not someone for us. It's not someone who has a paper degree and puts it on the wall. It's someone who has a combination of competence, confidence, and belief. And who actually certifies that competence and confidence is the community. So if it is, a water diviner. I don't know if you have water diviners in New Zealand. But if it's a water diviner, we consider him or her a professional. Because him, he, his record of finding water is as good or as bad as a geologist or a geophysicist going out for five years in a university. Traditional midwives are professionals for us. People who deliver babies in the village with nothing, no resources at all. Regrettably, half our members of parliament in India are still alive because of those traditional midwives. <laughs> so what's wrong with them? They must have some skill. So we recognize these extraordinary people in the Barefoot College. A traditional bone setter, you know, someone who picks his bones I got a famous orthopedic surgeon to come and have a look. He said, no, no, don't take me to these places. I said, please, come and have a look at this man who's setting bones in the middle of nowhere. And he saw this man setting bones, broken bones. He didn't know the name of the bone. He didn't know what he was doing. But he said he, he was absolutely flabbergasted to see this man setting bones, broken bones, that no orthopedic surgeon from any medical college could have done after five years, setting it perfectly. And someone asked him, how did you do it? My grandfather taught me, my father taught me. It's an oral tradition which comes down from the generations. And why are we losing this skill and knowledge? So the Barefoot College recognizes these extraordinary people. Why Barefoot? It's the only college in India where the learner is the teacher and the teacher is the learner. No one can say just because you've got a PhD, you've learned it all. You're just beginning. Because there's so much you can learn. You keep your eyes open, there's so much you can learn from these people. It's a place where people living on less than $1 a day are only invited to the college. People who are dropouts and cop-outs and washouts are invited to the college. People who have a master's and a PhD are disqualified to come. It has to be someone who works with his hands, someone who, work, who believes in the dignity of labor, and someone who has, who is respected by the community because they work with their hands. And it doesn't matter if they are illiterate, because they are respected for the work they do and the contribution they make to the community. It's the only college in India where we don't give a paper qualification, a paper certificate after training. <coughs> The certification is done by the community you serve, not by the university or college you go to. Because that is the ultimate test. Whether you have learned something, whether you have a skill which you can offer, whether your skill is accepted by the community, basic skills accepted by the community. It's 500 miles southwest of Delhi. It's in the middle of a desert. I've been there for 45 years. Sometimes it does not rain for five years. Water you get at 300 feet below the ground. Temperature is right now 40 degrees centigrade. When I talked about this and they said, all right, if you really believe that they have a skill to offer, then prove it on the ground. So in 1986, here's my first barefoot architect. He still can't read and write today but he's built me this whole campus at $1.50 a square foot. When we came to that stage and I went to a forester, very experienced, paper qualified forester, and I said, what should I grow in this land? 
and he had one look at it and said, nothing. You can't do anything, there's no water. Rock under the ground. So then I went to the old man in the village and I said, what should I do? Oh, he then named me a couple of species and he said, you grow and this will grow. And this is what it looks like today. Went to the roof and all the women said, now clear out because this is a technology you don't want to share with the men. How to waterproof the roofs. <laughs> so for three months, only the women were given the whole campus to waterproof. They used a bit of urine of the cow and some jaggery, and they don't share the formula with us, but it hasn't leaked for 13 years now. So there must be some technology that they deserve and they don't want to share. It's the only college which is fully solar energized. All the power for the, for the college comes from the sun. And this is my first barefoot solar engineer. He's a Hindu priest, looks after the temple. Only done five, six years of primary schooling. But he knows more about solar energy engineer, engineering than anyone I know anywhere in the world. And I have been around. 45 kilowatts of panels on the roof. He's installed it all individually and did it in 1986. 45 kilowatts of panel, my telephone exchange works off solar, my photocopying machine works off solar, 17 computers work off solar, 700 lights and fans work off solar. For the next 25 years, so long as the sun shines, I have no problem with power. We have optical fiber cable and it's the only college in India, in rural India, where we have uh, video conferencing. It has a speed post service, so if you should happen to buy any Telonia handicraft, uh, we will make some handicrafts within seven days from this little post office, it will reach you anywhere in the world. We believe in decentralization. So all the power, all the power uh, plants are decentralized in the campus. So if one should go out of order, the other four still work. This is a concept and approach we believe in and we've replicated. So in brief, I'll just, just a brief overview of the Barefoot College and we'll explain a bit more. There is audio. You got it? 38 years ago, in a small village called Tilonia in Ajmer district, Rajasthan, it had an 80,000 square foot campus designed and built at one and a half dollars a square foot by barefoot architects who were barely literate. It is one of the few places in India where the simple lifestyle and work style of Mahatma Gandhi is still alive. Built and managed by the poor, who earn less than one dollar a day. It's a place where traditional and indigenous knowledge, practical skills and village wisdom is given more value, importance and respect than paper degrees. Only the very poor, the rural dropouts, cop-outs and washouts, who have been rejected by the formal educational system, are invited to come to be trained as solar and water engineers, teachers, doctors, designers, architects, pathologists, dentists, all barefoot professionals who are providing basic services to over 100,000 people in nearly 100 villages spread over 500 square miles. to a 400,000
thousand liter rainwater harvesting tank constructed under the stage where performances and meetings are held. Not one drop of rain is allowed to go waste. Surface water is collected in a hundred foot open well to recharge the groundwater and revitalize dry hand pumps. The idea of collecting rainwater has been extended to over 1200 schools all over the country collecting 93 million liters of rainwater. It is a unique place for learning and unlearning, for trying out-of-the-box ideas. Failing, making mistakes and trying again. For living and working together without barriers of caste, sex, religion, when no one comes for the money but for the challenge. Brave new ideas have come out of these very ordinary people. The concept of night schools for children who cannot go to school during the day. Now, 150 solar lit night schools reach nearly 5,000 children.
Funds have come from the government of India for the travel and training course under ITEC. has shown the tremendous power and skills of very ordinary people all over the world to identify problems and offer their own low-cost effective solutions. It is the solutions that come from the people, from practical experience, from the wisdom of the villages, away from the formal educational system, that are acceptable and sustainable where we see hope for the future. It's a college where we don't take any written contracts. You come for the challenge, you come for the work, and stay with us as equals. No one can get more than $100 a month in the college, however long you stay. You can stay with me for 25 years and you can go tomorrow. No one stops you, no piece of paper stops you from growing and staying. It's a college where we evaluate ourselves after one year, two, after three years, and we give each other points. Honesty, integrity, creativity, community contact. And on the basis of that, your salary can go up or down. If your community contact is low, then your salary can go down. And nowhere is it written. So that's because I'm the director of the organization, I should, get the large, I should get the highest salary. My salary is somewhere in between because my community contact is very low and they give me zero for it. <laughs> it's worked so far. And there's no hierarchy. There's only a structure. And that structure is collectively managed and controlled by the community. We also believe that women should be given much more importance, should be given many opportunities for acquiring more skills than the men. And that is a revolution in Rajasthan, because in Rajasthan they are very traditional and men, women don't go out, mostly out of their houses. This is the first woman solar engineer of Rajasthan. She, back, she resisted her family, she resisted her husband, and she said she wanted to learn. And as a result, she's become a role model. She's become a role model. And now there are more than 76 women all over India who become solar engineers, just because she has set an example. We've got women from Ladakh, we've got women, women from Tibet, we've got women in India from all over the the least um, developed states of India, Bihar. We also have a community radio where 50,000 people listen to our programs every day. All programs which have been designed, tailor-made for the community, and there is a place where they can also react to some of the information that we are sending through the radio. We fabricate the radio in the Barefoot College. 
they have the dentist and this woman in another six months will also be performing a root canal, hopefully, and then illiterate. Buck Minister Fuller, very famous architect, had designed this concept of a geodesic dome. And he said you have to go through a very elaborate training degree course to be able to make these geodesic domes. So when someone said that to me, I went to the village blacksmith and I said, can you design this dome for me? No problem. So he's designed me over a hundred domes, hundred and right. He's designed me over a hundred domes which he used for meeting halls, internet cafe, pathology laboratory. And this is a physically challenged person who we picked up from a village and said, you know, in six months you're going to be a pathologist. And he said, I don't know what this means. But in six months, only through hands-on, he now is my barefoot pathologist who um, tests urine, blood, HIV for 10 rupees, what would otherwise cost me a thousand rupees in a city. These are all geodesic domes where the roof is made out of uh, thatch and where we shouldn't be using wood but using waste material, these houses have been built on the border of India and Pakistan, all solar lit. Most of these villages, which are on the border of India and Pakistan, are now generating income as a result of the solar lanterns which have been provided. And these are all household income generating activities, decentralized. When we went to Ladakh, up in the mountains, 14,000 feet up in the mountains, minus 40 outside, and we asked this woman, who got solar light for the first time, and you asked her, what is the benefit that uh, you got from solar lighting? And she said, it's the first time I can see my husband's face in winter. <laughs> so for six months, she's only with a candlelight, sharing with goats and animals, one room like that. And, you, and, and it's all snowed out, and she has to come out from the roof in most of these houses in Ladakh. So that's the spread of the barefoot approach in solar lighting all over India. We have a workshop, and in the workshop we also fabricate solar cookers. And this solar cooker is a parabolic solar cooker which gives us 60 meals twice a day. But the beauty is that this has been fabricated by four grandmothers who still can't read and write today. They are the mothers and grandmothers all sitting together and unfortunately they're almost half German because they're so precise. <laughs> <laughs> That's the workshop. They also do the welding, they do the measuring, all hands on. And that is a clock which has been fabricated by these illiterate grandmothers. And the clock actually moves the solar cooker with the sun. Very complicated, and this has to be very precise when you make this cooker. And they made about 20, 30 of them, and they're selling them in villages where they shouldn't be using wood or kerosene. Wherever the percentage of illiteracy is very high, we don't use newspapers, we don't use television, we use puppetry. This puppet, his name is Jokhim Chacha. He is 300 years old. He knows everything was happening in the village around him. He knows all the gossip. He's my psychoanalyst. He's my doctor. He's my teacher. He's my lawyer. He's my problem solver. And he raises money for me. And wherever there are disputes that I have in villages, tension in the village. We bring Jokim Chacha out and he solves all my disputes. He's made out of recycled World Bank reports. <laughs> we talk about social messages, very powerful social messages. 
why you shouldn't beat your wife, why you should have safe drinking water, what are the laws of the land, if you're arrested, what should you do, family planning, all this Joachim Chacha knows. And Joachim Chacha, along with all these puppets, every year we reach over 100,000 people through these puppet shows. Use solar lanterns at night for these puppet shows. We have a big puppet too. Huge puppet where we can attract people at night. Whenever the puppet show in these and that solar lit inside, all the people then know there's a puppet show coming on and then that's how we attract people to come and see. It goes on for hours and it's interactive. The puppet show can easily be stopped halfway and someone says, look, my wife is pregnant, what should I do? So the puppet should be able to answer what you should do. So it, may be, it may be an issue, it may be on literacy, but then there's someone who has an urgent question and he wants some answers and he believes that Joachim Chata is the person who can give him the right answer. So in, in the middle of the performance, someone gets up and says, I have a problem with my lawyer, what should I do? Who should I go to? I have a problem with my wife who's, be who's beating the child, what should I do? Uh, all these problems my puppet solves for me. He's worth several thousand dollars for me. That's it. That's our key. Water is also a major issue for us. And there is a village very close by where water is very brackish. It's like seawater. So what we've done is to have the first solar operated reverse osmosis plant, which we've installed. The cost is within reasonable limits. It is about $50,000, but you will get 6,000 uh, liters of sweet water every day. And people are for the first time willing to pay for it. That's the Sambar Lake. We have actually taken buildings which were once schools, which were deserted by the government, and converted them into solar operated reverse osmosis plants. only repaired and maintained by women. We won't allow any men to be trained. And this is a grandmother who is now the first barefoot training, a barefoot uh, solar operated reverse osmosis plant in Jibbe. We take deserted school buildings which governments have deserted and we make them into solar operated plants. 60% of the children don't go to school in the morning in many parts of, the, of India. And they only, they look after the chores of the parents, fetch drinking water, fetch firewood, but they only have time in the evening. So in 1975, we started the first night schools of Kilonia, where children, were shepherd boys and girls, come to school at night. This was in 1975. Since then, it's We've had 150 night schools which are solar operated. 7,000 children come to these schools. The beauty is that every three years, we run 225 schools for 7,000 children. Every three years, we have an election where six to 14 year old boys and girls elect a prime minister. Prime Minister is 12 years old. She looks after 20 goats in the morning, but she's Prime Minister in the evening. And she has a cabinet. We believe that the children should know about the democratic process, about citizenship, about how you should elect your leaders. And so, this is the cabinet. The Prime Minister has a cabinet, Minister for Energy, Minister for Education, Minister for Women, and they all sit one month, every month they sit and decide on how they should run their schools. Very powerful, the Prime Minister. If she should write a postcard to me saying that this teacher is misbehaving, misusing the solar lantern, not coming in time, not opening the school in time, he's fired. So the Prime Minister is very important when she writes me a postcard. 
seven years ago, the Prime Minister went to Sweden and got the first World's Children's Prize from, Sweden, from the Queen of Sweden. And a Queen of Sweden there who couldn't believe that this uh, young girl, 12 years old, uh, had so much confidence, she wasn't dazzled by anything around her. And she asked me to ask the Prime Minister who's on her left, uh, where did she get her confidence from? And she turned to the Queen straight in the eye and said, please tell her I'm the Prime Minister. <laughs> we believe that every drop of rain must be collected. If there is any school, anywhere in the developing world, anywhere in the island states, even if there is enough water, you must collect rainwater as a policy. So wherever we have schools, we actually build this rainwater harvesting structure. It's very easy. You connect the roof on the top into an underground tank. You have a sedimentation tank where you collect all the impurities. And that's a 50,000 liter underground tank. You can even have people playing over the tank so that you don't even see the tank. And you can have night schools, even people sitting next to that. You have a meeting with the community. The community chooses the site. The community actually builds, digs the tank, waterproofs it. Waterproofing, you cover it. You connect it to the rooftops. And there is 50,000 liters in six months. You can build this tank using community materials, community knowledge, community labor. And we have a great patron, the Prince of Wales. He's come twice to Kelonia. And he's a great supporter of the Barefoot College. And he's a patron of this whole rain, uh, movement of rainwater harvesting all over the world. There's another way of collecting rainwater. And this is, we learned 300 years ago. There was a, there was a, this is, the situation in the summer lake, which is a salt lake. And about 25,000 people earn income from the salt that is produced. But water is a very big problem there. And it comes from miles and sometimes it doesn't come at all. So you can see the pressure on the water. This is the environment that we have around us. So what we did was to locate a dam which was built by the Muslims 300 years ago they located it perfectly, but it was just collapsed. So we thought we would revitalize that dam by collecting the water where they'd already been located. That was the location of the dam and that was the water. And all the water was flowing away from the community into the salt lake. So we thought we'd dam it right there. So we got the people together. And by constructing that dam, what it is, you could percolate over 1.8 billion liters of water into the ground and recharge over hundreds of wells and hand pumps, which were within a radius of 10 kilometers. <coughs> People got together, and that was the reach. If you, had collect, if you had collected water in that dam, you can see the amount of villages around 10 kilometers who would have benefited just by collecting that water. It was a community solution, not an engineering solution. When we went to the engineers of the government, they said, not possible. We don't believe in it. So we went back to the community and said, now let's do this on our own. So they constructed the dam. Now you see, this is the dam that they constructed. Keep a track of that yellow dot. How many people got employment? 1,000 people in May, five months. <laughs> 16 million liters were collected just by making that dam strategically.
two rainfalls, one rainfall in July, and within four or five days, because it was so, so dry, all the water went into the ground and recharged. That was the impact of the dam. How many months it took us, how many people got employed, and how many skilled laborers on it. As a result, 20 villages benefited. Just hand pumps which are dry got water. Wells which are dry got revitalized for agriculture. Simple, low cost community solution. As a result, more water is accessible, more wells are recharged, more agriculture is possible, and the cost. 25,000 pounds just by one dam. Can you imagine how many people benefit? Now I shall go to solar. That's my second love. First is water, second is solar. When we demonstrated that it was possible to train women as engineers in India, and we went to Afghanistan. And I went to Afghanistan and they said, I wanted to take three women from Afghanistan. Not possible. Forget it. No chance. Husbands won't let them go out of their room, then you want to take them to India. Are you crazy? I said, all right. I will take the husbands along as well. So the husbands came. Of course, the women were much more intelligent than the husbands. They picked it up like a shot. In three months, this woman, this woman, and this is my best barefoot solar engineer of Afghanistan, 55 years old. She solar electrified 200 houses for me in Afghanistan, still working today. And in fact, she also agreed to speak to a, a workshop full of heads of departments of engineers in, in Afghanistan. And she very politely explained to the head of an engineering department in Afghanistan the difference between AC and DC. The guy didn't know. <laughs> She's right now looking after 20 solar operated reverse osmosis plants in Afghanistan. These three women have now trained 27 more women, grandmothers in Afghanistan, and solar electrified 100 villages. What did the Barefoot College do? Only train these three extraordinary women. I made a film and I said, the cost of taking six men and women to India, flew them into India, train them for six months, buy 150 panels, solar electrify five villages in Afghanistan, the first ever, and it was the cost of one UN consultant sitting for one year in Kabul, 15 <coughs> papers. And they said, you can't show this in a film. I said, why not? Aren't you wasting $150,000 on one consultant sitting in Kabul for one year? They said, yes, and you have 700 of them there, and not one village have you solar electrified today. This, we went into to Africa. In Africa today, this is what they use for lighting. And they call it by many names in you know, different parts of Africa. We thought that instead of using this kerosene lamp, we should give them solar lighting. This is what they spend every month. So the whole barefoot approach is you will collect the whole community together. The community decides how much they're willing to pay for the solar light if it comes. And usually they decide on what they already pay for kerosene, candles, stores, batteries, and fuel. Each house will have a light. And I was wondering if there are places in New Zealand which can do this process. If there are some remote places where we can try solar lighting. You form a committee, collect a contribution, and then the grandmother is selected by the community. A workshop is given by the community. And then, I have a great deal 
extraordinary deal with the government of India. Mr. Verma here will bear me out. If I should choose a grandmother from any part of the world, the government of India pays the airfare and six months training costs to come to India. There is no other progressive government I've seen that will do this. The underwriting of 40 women coming every six months from eight or nine countries around the world to come and train as barefoot solar engineers. This is a true story about ordinary heroes. This is about very simple rural women in Africa from Ethiopia to Gambia, from Mauritania to Tanzania, from Sudan to South Africa. A quiet revolution is taking place. Illiterate and semi-literate rural visit to the Barefoot College where he also spent the night 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama blessed the women solar engineers on the 13th of February 2011. <laughs> so those villagers, even grandmother, physically also old and illiteracy, Yet, through training, was a millionaire around sector of the by 2013, by including Liberia, South Africa, Southern Sudan, Zimbabwe, Burundi, Zanzibar, almost all the countries in the continent of Africa will have been covered, saving 1.5 million liters of kerosene from polluting the environment and thousands of tons of wood from being cut, depleting the already fragile forest. The Indian government has approved the proposal to establish five barefoot training centers Solar electrify an additional 11,000 houses in 200 more villages spread over the whole continent of Africa. ...in Jamban, and there's a light of India. We're very happy tonight because it was very, very dark in Jamban before. There is no question. The barefoot approach is here to stay. What Mahatma Gandhi said comes to mind. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you. We have gone just now to come from a trip to the Pacific Islands. We have selected about 20 mothers from seven islands in the Pacific. And they will all come to the Barefoot College in September. First time ever. We already have 10 women grandmothers from Fiji. And three months ago, the, press, the Prime Minister of Fiji came to India and I said, you must meet your grandmothers. He said, I've got no time, what is all this? I said, no, then I'll bring the grandmothers to you. So he brought the 10 grandmothers from Fiji to him. You know, the Prime Minister is a hardened Commodore from the Navy. And uh, he doesn't show emotion at the best of times. He actually had tears in his eyes when he, when he heard the experiences of these 10 grandmothers. Within days, he asked the Minister for Environment to come to the Barefoot College and see what this is all about. Is this, a, is this a joke or is this something really happening? So the Minister has just returned and she's also been inspired, I believe. So I think the Barefoot approach is going to spread all over the Pacific Islands. If anyone wants to be on board and be a part of this process, we'll be delighted. We also believe in partnerships. The Barefoot College is a very small organization, but the ideas have spread all over the world. And so we have people on board who are the UN Women, which is the new UN organization, which has now said they would like to be on board. So the government of India looks after the training and the travel and UN Women looks after the money for the hardware. UNESCO is also on board, the UNDP is on board. So we have a partnership where everyone knows their responsibilities. And the eventual benefit is, of course, the grandmothers around the world. When the Dalai Lama came to Barefoot College, he said, you know, I have a challenge for some, some people. He said, you saw now that you have shown me that the Barefoot College is working in practice. Let's see if the researchers and the professors and the experts can make it work in theory. <laughs> I'm doing everything wrong. I'm not following any rule. I'm just going by gut. And something seems to be working. The impact seems to be there. So why is it not possible? Where is it written that just because you can't read and write, you can't become an engineer? But everyone, every barefoot woman engineer, the 230 who came to India and went back, went back to the NGO and said, now I want to learn how to read and write. I didn't know the importance before, but now I really feel the need that you do. So there is a way of promoting literacy in a very indirect way. Once you give them a skill, then the importance of literacy is much more important for them. Thank you very much.